Mystery Science Theater 3000, show 501, real one. Hey, let's do this! Now we have hey, five minutes fun. to discuss the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll have a little more time. We can figure this out. We can make it quick. <coughs> It'll work. I... Cons- considering I'll make it easy, you hated, like, everything this year. Well, I was fortunate enough at the at the um, at the at the uh, warning bell last night. I was able to sneak in the viewing of the Zone of Interest. That makes two decent movies for me, at least out of the seven of the ten nominations that we have. Now, uh, I, I forget. I'm, I probably asked you this before a million times. Uh, when did we go from five Best Picture nominees to ten? As the movies are so dark, fucking night, awesome. dark as of as of fifteen years ago this year. So fifteen because uh, well, two thousand nine was the last year where we had five nominations, and twenty ten was when they started with uh, multiple up to ten. And it was because of the it was because of the whole Dark Knight debacle because everybody and their mother and I thought that that movie except I, for me and thought I that agree movie. with them. I agree with them. Dark Knight was. The best movie of 20, 2008. Like, so that was the year of Slumdog Millionaire, I think. And I still think that's one of Danny Boyle's least movies that he's ever made. I, I enjoyed it. Slumdog I mean, Millionaire. I thought it was a I thought it was a bold, incredible, refreshing movie. Not a movie I want to go back and revisit. I there are other Danny Boyle movies that I go back and look at, but not that one. But it was it was a fine movie. That was the last year, was, right? I mean, okay. That well, the 2009 Oscars was the last year where we had five nominees, and those yeah. nominees were Slumdog, Benjamin Button, Frost Nixon, Milk, and The Reader. Uh, Milk is the only one of that list I have not seen. It's interesting too because I saw the Times of Harmony Milk, the, the the documentary based on him. My my wife loves Milk. <laughs> loves I don't. Movie it's not, for me, it's not a good movie because it's just too—it's too political for the time period it was supposed to I, be. I actually, I'm going ra- to raise you one better. It's not a good movie because Sean Penn is in it. Um, you know, Sean Penn—he makes—he looks like Harvey Milk. I mean, like, well, you know, he looks like a movie star playing a, a real character, but he's very close to the look. And then you have Josh Brolin playing his rival who kills him in the. Ma- well, I mean, we—you kind of know the story of Milk anyway if you—if you know anything about the story, the true story before watching the movie. Mm-hmm. So. You know, but the thing I, I I had no I don't know why I I never got around to seeing it, but I saw all the other movies, um, and I enjoyed them. You know, Slum Dog is fine. Benjamin Button was okay, a little too long. Nice, you know, kind of you know, adventure. Yeah, Everyone thought Ross Nixon. Knight I really Dark enjoyed. Dark Knight could have broke the mold. I think the reader could have probably... broke the mold that year and actually, you know, been the first movie of its kind. I love that movie to death. I know you don't, but I love it to death. Right, I think right. It's one and of the best com. I think it's one of the best comic book movies ever made. So I think as a, it, it, you know, I mean, it's Nolan is really. I mean, I've come to a lot of realizations about Nolan over the years. Looking at his films, he seems to not. I mean, we'll get into that in a second, but I want to bring up the next year. You have the 2010 Oscars, and then you have that. that okay. That was the notable year because it was the year that uh, Catherine Bigelow was up against her ex-husband, Hurt Locker, and Avatar. Hurt Locker was, seriously, I mean, I watched that and I was just like, wow, this is exactly what a movie should be. Avatar is not my thing. And and even my daughter, who was like four years old, I think, when the movie came out, even she wasn't all that impressed by Avatar. (laughs) It was funny. Well, Um, I'll say this much. (laughs) Avatar has not aged all that well. And I thought Hurt Locker was I. Uh, um, it's strange, though. I mean, it's just, it's such a, I don't know. The, the Avatar is just I was not. Ha- I was happy that, I, I'll say this much. I was happy that Catherine Bigelow got it because yeah. she's had a great, she's had a great career. You know, she made my favorite vampire movie of all time, fucking Near Dark. Greatest vampire movie ever made, Bill fucking Paxton. She is, she is like this. She's a chick filmmaker who makes macho movies. I mean, this is like, yes, right. thank you. you know, this is like, exactly what fucking, we need. We actually need Point this. Break, K-19, Strange Days. I mean, mm-hmm. hell, dude, she's a phenomenal fucking filmmaker. Yeah, and, it's, you know, it's, and, and then she Is she even getting any funny. work these days? Because she's well, not. Well, she did Zero Dark Thirty. Yeah, that was a few years ago, though, right? Yeah, but then was again, like, she probably... I think she's still working. She just, you know, she doesn't have to work too hard anymore, you know, because all the notoriety she has doesn't have to work too hard anymore. Yeah, but we we really need more more film directors like her because she actually, yeah, I mean, you know, like, 
you know how they're doing it now? They're like picking these names out of hats that met, meet certain diversity qualifications. And then they, they make, they, they call them directors, but they don't really direct. Then they bring in action directors to actually direct the action sequences. And those people don't get any kind of, no, right. It's like the most recent one was, um, what was that one? Uh, blah, 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 blah. The, the one that wasn't Madam Web, the one before Madam Web. Oh, uh, the Marvels. Oh, oh, Morbius. Yeah, I mean, the, um, in the Marvels, you have this uh, person who calls themselves a director, but they're just really directing setups between actors and not really doing any action sequences. The thing about Catherine Bigelow is she directs action sequences, okay? She actually picks up the camera and does these things. You know, and she's not gonna, she's not gonna be content to just sit there and just, oh, just be, be our poster girl. For this movie because you're a director no she actually goes directs projects she actually originates projects you know her and i mean that, 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 that probably why the industry hated james cameron for so much is that he goes and does things you know people are that, that he actually goes and makes the movies you know well, yeah look at I me mean, look at how we worked under corman yeah no, I, I mean, mean that's, i mean corman was film I mean, school corman was the guy if yeah. you wanted to learn it get an education in film you went to corman and that's All what he them. did. I mean, I mean, I think the biggest budgeted movie that Corman ever did, James Cameron was responsible for, and that was Galaxy of Terror. Because I think, like, you talk about Corman budgets, that was like a $2 million movie, you know. And even then, he still, you know, did cheap shit. But for him to spend $2 million on a movie, that's that's pretty absurd for Corman, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, and you, a lot you know, of, and all, it depends. It was all if special he, effects. Yeah, it, it if Corman got the money, then he would he he could get the money if he had the cast. Like for instance, he made a movie. Uh, I forget if it was for a studio, but it was Avalanche. Do you remember that movie? Yeah, I, remember. I have that on DVD. I have that. On it's Rock DVD. Hudson and Mia Farrow, and you've got like a bunch of Robert Forster's in it too. And I think it might have been made for a big studio. I'm not sure, but it was made with a big budget. And I, Cameron may have even worked on it actually because. It required a lot of mat work, as you know, and Corman figures out a way to stretch a dollar. But mm -hmm. um, you know, he'll 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 be he'll get a budget if he gets like name actors attached. But this this year is very interesting because you do have a weird mix of art films, niche films, and then uh, popular mainstream films. Film. Yeah, mainstream. So you have the Hurt Locker, you have Avatar, you have The Blind Side, which is another movie I never saw but heard about so many times. Is that the one with Sandra Bullock? Yeah, well, the the problem is that that's another movie that has not aged well because it turns out, you know, there's a lot of fiction in that story regarding Michael Orr and everything like that. I hear there's a bunch I, of I've people, members of his family I, I, want money. I mean, but here's the sad part, okay? The guy who made Blindside, he made a better movie, The Founder. Oh, I never I never got to see that. That's uh, the You've one never about seen The Founder? Oh no, no. God, it shows, what is it's, wrong with you? Well, it shows up on Netflix, and um, I haven't gotten to see it yet, but I'll probably get around. Dude, that movie's fucking amazeballs. It's like one of the best fucking. He's basically a Ray Kroc, right? And he's like, "You guys, right. you guys should right. make an assembly line for these burgers, and then we can have this thing called fast food." Well, yeah. no, 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 no. It has nothing to do. No, the the brothers already invented it. He fucking stole it. Oh, so he was a thief. So he stole their idea. Well, he stole their company. Because of okay, I don't want to get into it. it. It's 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 nothing I really want to talk about right now. Okay, just 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 fucking watch it. Okay, all right, all right, all right. What, fucking watch. Um, Such a good Michael Keaton is amazing in this movie. He is Michael amazing. Keaton, well, Michael Keaton's always good. You know, he's just plain reliable. But um, so moving on, we have District Nine, which is a Peter Jackson movie. I think I might have seen. That. I'm not sure. It's a what is it? Some kind of science fiction thing, right? <laughs> I am so. Wrong. I was wow. too busy. I was too busy seen... raising a daughter. I was too busy taking care of a child to, to have anything. So, so My you, God! You go from telling me you've never seen The Founder and you fucking haven't seen District Nine. Oh my! I probably God, dude. they probably show it on TBS every now and okay, then, and I get all, little I'm gonna, snippets. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to correct you right there. District Nine is not a Peter Jackson movie. However, it is. Oh, it's Neil Blomkamp. By, sorry. Yeah, Neil Blomkamp. He produced. produced it. He by, produced. It was probably made by uh, his Weta uh, division in, in well, New Zealand Weta, with all the visual yeah, Weta, Weta, they did Weta, all the Weta. effects for it. Weta, 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 Dude, Weta, Weta. Another, another great fucking movie that you haven't seen. Oh, my God. Again, I mean, there's, like, there's only a couple watched, of movies. You know what's funny? I watched District 9 in the last six months because I just wanted to watch it one day because I hadn't seen it in a minute. And I'm like, I need to watch District 9. If, that, if there were ever a movie out there that needed a fucking sequel, it was District 9. <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, I'll take your word for it. I'll watch it at some point. And then, okay, after oh, that, there's a movie God. called An Education, which I've never heard of. And Glorious never Bastards. Heard. And Glorious Bastards I did not watch until a couple of years after because, again, I had a four-year-old running around like a psycho. Precious, based on the novel Push by Sapphire, which I, 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 I heard of, but um, a lot of people misconstrued as some kind of uh, black urban drama when it really wasn't. From what I understand, the director, Lee Daniels, is a big fan of John Waters, so... There's a lot of John yeah. Waters stuff going on in there, and people weren't aware of it. Then it was a Serious Man, which is a Coen Brothers movie, which I barely heard of. I think. I yeah, that one. That one got a very limited release. Like it didn't get a big nationwide push or anything like that. It popped mm-hmm. up in a few theaters around here, but yeah, yeah, it was one of the movies you had to drive to go see. Right, and then you have two movies with Up in the title. There's Up, the original. My my wife did see with Regan because it's a kids movie. I never saw it myself. And then, and then up in the air, up in the air, which I which I did see a few years back, but I did not see the year it came out. This is the one about the guy who fires people, right? He travels from one location to another. He's yep. a he's a like a professional firing guy or something that Human Resources yep. hires because you don't want to get your employee pissed off at Human Resources, so you hire George Clooney, and then he's like, you know. That's it. Okay, uh, what I wanted to do, okay, so that was the first year that we had 10 nominees, and really, it is a mixed bag, and it's like doubling down. It's like the Academy doubling down, saying, oh, movies are so much better than they've ever been, ever, that we have to have 10 nominees, which is just a bunch of horseshit, because movies are fucking horrible. And really, I'm not impressed anymore. I I do want to go back, though, to 40 years ago. I want to compare our nominees from this year to 40 years ago, which would be the 1984 ceremonies. Where is that? Yeah. So for movies that came out in 1983, well, for movies yeah, that no, came no, out in that was, no, that that's the year, uh, dude. I don't even need to research it. That was the year of Jim Brooks. It was, yes, that's true. That was the year um, of Jim Brooks. But let me see here. Okay, you have the it's a 56 Academy 56 Academy Award ceremony yeah, on April, April 9th, and, the right hey. stu- and the right stuff. My, uh, my wedding anniversary, except many years before, 1984. Uh, and your Best Picture nominees were Terms of Endearment, The Big Chill, The Right, the right Stuff, The Dresser, and uh, Tender Mercies. And that's five Tender movies. Mercy. That's it. You're done. Yeah, um, Robert, Robert Duvall got Best Actor that year for Tender Mercies. Now, I'm going to say, I'll say right now, um, I can tell you this safely. Every one of these nominees I've seen except for one movie. Okay, <laughs> let dresser. me guess. Uh, it's just like, The Dresser. The dresser, yeah. I've even seen yeah. Ruben Ruben and Betrayal. I've seen those movies. I've seen Educating. Educating Rita was a favorite of mine because it played on cable constantly, and I loved it. And Michael Caine is awesome. Uh, I've seen, I have seen Big Chill. I've seen Terms of Endearment. I've seen The Right Stuff. I have not seen Tender Mercies, although I hear it's a very good Tender movie. Mercies is it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a character drama, and it's a movie that you just don't get anymore because they don't, they don't promote them like they do. I think that's that's the issue. What we're looking at is a lot of movies, especially like at least four or five of the movies in the bestseller in the best song. The best picture nominee list this year are movies that were not promoted extensively. Well, I was gonna say, um, okay, <sighs> let's take the dresser out of the equation, okay? Hmm? Um, Tender Mercies and the Right Stuff were both bombs. Terms of Endearment, I think, won because that was, I think that movie outgrossed the big chill. I think it it's, did. It's, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, I would I would probably agree with that. It was definitely yeah. one of the more popular uh, at the box office. The big chill was was popular. Uh, the Dresser but, but, is an art film. Time, the right stuff cost too much money and didn't. And as also time was, has gone on. Wasn't it United Artists? Been, what? No, the right stuff. No, that was the Lad Company. That was the movie that bankrupted. Oh, the oh, oh, company. okay. But I was right. I was right about one thing. It was the studio's fault because they didn't have any money to promote it. Right. Well, the and it killed the Lad Company. I, I was going to say, time has gone on to say that the right stuff was the movie that probably should have gotten all the awards that year. And it's I'm an incredible, semi- yeah, it's, it's an, an amazing incredible movie. movie. It's an amazing it is. movie. I remember seeing it on cable back in the day and remembering that it's a three-hour movie, and I was like a nine-year-old kid, and I wasn't bored by it in the slightest. I, uh, that's only happened recently. There was, um, okay, we watched, uh, last week we watched The Great Escape. It was a movie I had never seen before. Um, directed by John Sturgis with that incredible cast. You have, you know, Steve McQueen, Charles Bronson, Richard Attenborough, you know, people like that, David McCallum. We were watching all these movies, and we watched The Magnificent Seven and and The Great Escape, 
back to back because they were directed by the same guy with the same cast, basically, right? And I'm watching it. And I'm yep. like, God, this is not boring in the slightest. This is three hours long and it's gripping. It's incredibly enthralling. And I was thinking that that was the same with the right stuff. You know how they talk about the Brat Pack, right? Around that yeah. time. This is sort of a Brat Pack, but it's an older generation. So, but it introduced oh, all the yeah, actors. It's, it's much older. You know, you got Glenn Close. You've got <coughs> Jeff Goldblum. You've got... No, I was, I was thinking about just... the, the right stuff is what I was talking about. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. But this movie launches the careers of Fred Ward, Dennis Quaid, Ed Harris, Scott Glenn. Lance Henriksen is in this. You have... Oh, Jeff Goldblum is in it, too. I forgot to mention. He has a little cameo okay. on the right stuff because I think he was friends with uh, with Philip Kaufman because of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. That's at least the one thing you can say about Philip Kaufman. He never made, he never made a bad movie. He never did. Not even the ones that no. were um, controversial, Henry and June, or the ones that uh, may have been controversial for other reasons like Rising Sun, which I, I enjoyed, too. Yeah, I um, like Rising Sun. The man, that's a man who never made a bad movie as far as I'm concerned. He's also kind of a maverick and people don't want to work with him anymore. And that's sort of the big issue with Hollywood. Now, we move on to these nominees for this year. Are we at the 96th Academy Awards? And 40 years later, and we're looking, okay. Now, as I said, how many of these Best Picture nominees have you seen? I have seen Killers of the Flower Moon. I have seen Oppenheimer. And I have, I want to say that's it. I refuse to watch Barbie. <laughs> I, you could tell I, me that there's a, that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow with that movie. I could give two shits and a fuck. I'm there sorry. Is no, there I, I am a, you are older than me, but I am a 41 year old male. I am not the demographic. I have no fucking interest. You're also whatsoever. straight. <laughs> well, that, and I'm just going to also put it out there. I'm not the biggest fan of Noah Baumbach. So, <laughs> um, I like, I liked Noah Baumbach's early stuff. I liked his work with Wes Anderson. He wrote Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou, and he directed oh, real a quick, really- Oh, was, was the was the Holdovers. Is that also nominated for Best Picture? It is. It is, yes. I, okay, I watched the Holdovers. I right. didn't think it was anything fucking special. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, yeah. I mean, um, okay. Okay. The acting, the acting, and that is good. Don't get me wrong. I mean, dude, it's Paul Giamatti. I love Paul Giamatti. Another guy who's barely ever made a bad movie. But he's yeah. Paul Giamatti is one of those rare actors that makes everything good better just by being in it. He's wonderful. Right. He's just a, and, he's you know, like a genuine. He's not. He doesn't even strike me as an actor. I can't even imagine him as an actor. I can imagine him walking around the street talking to himself. You know that kind of guy. But. He was in a great. I, I can I can appreciate what Alexander Payne really tried to do in making that movie. The, the problem is, mm -hmm. you made this movie with this '70s aesthetic, but then you you kind of pigeonholed yourself because you made a movie that pretty much anybody could have made in the '70s or '80s. Well, except it's too long. It's over two hours. If it were a yeah, 70s it movie, a bit, it would have yeah, been 90 minutes. It is minutes. a little long in the tooth. It is long There's in also, the tooth. I, mean, I, I don't I, know why, but they digitally make the titles wobble as though you're watching a film. And it just doesn't look house, right. There's like a grindhouse print. And, and I don't like that. But it just doesn't look shot. right. It, yeah. Well, it was shot digital anyway. That's another thing I don't like. Like, dude, don't shoot on digital. Like, don't be like Rodriguez, okay? Don't fucking shoot on digital and then manipulate it to look like a grindhouse movie, okay? That that's just bullshit, right there. And also, that, I mean, like on, the subject shoot matter on doesn't fucking blend film. well. Shoot on that, film. Yeah. Shoot on fucking film. It's basically kind of like I don't know a talky comedy drama, and talky comedy dramas were not the thing in the seventies. You know, and, no. and what's more, seventies movies were a lot harsher. Every movie that I've seen from the seventies always has kind of a downer ending. Uh, we watched this really lovely film that I remember when I was a kid called Going in Style. It's about three old men who rob a bank and uh, George Burns, Art Carney, and Lee Strasberg. And they, they rob a bank and, you know, they die. I mean, the only one who lives at the end is, is George Burns because, I don't know, it, it, they're old men, so they die. And it kind of ends in that way. There are other movies that I could, and you know, like, you know, movies that you think are about victory that aren't really like Rocky. Rocky loses at the end. The Bad News Bears, they lose at the end. I mean, right. the well, 70s the was about Rocky losing. Knows, it was about death. Okay. In the case of Rocky, all he said he wanted to do was go the distance. He said, no one's ever gone the distance with Creed. He I didn't care if yeah. I win. I just want to go the distance. He didn't win so. the match, but he, he won his soul. <laughs> well, it's more, more or less. Dun, dun, dun. Hold on. Hold on. Nope, I'll say it better. Creed Nobody. said it best than Rocky too. And so I won, but I didn't beat him. Yeah, well, he got his, you know, he got his prize money though. He got his purse money. 
got the purse, but you know, it's like he says, I want to be like, yes, I won the fight, but I didn't fucking knock him out. I wanted to knock him out. I wanted to beat him. You know, and that's yeah. what I like about Rocky. You know, Rocky, my, my wife loves Rocky. I don't know how I got her. I don't know how I pulled that one off, but uh, I'm proud of that. That was all me. Well, the thing about it is, Rocky, there's so much about Rocky to love. You don't hate Rocky. Nobody hates Rocky. That's a classic movie. And, and it was nominated for Best yeah, Picture. Yeah. And, it, yeah, and it was nominated. the budget was and less was. than a million dollars. And it, and it made over 300, which means it made 300 times back its investment. So it was like the only profitable Rocky movie. Frankly, with all the money that was spent later on. Well, I, okay. The, t- t- truth be told, the only Rocky, Rocky Four was not profitable. Went, Rocky Four. Rocky cost Four was too much. profitable. Rocky it was forty four, million dollar budget. It was a forty million. Yeah, but it then, made the most. But it made the most money out of all the Rocky movies. But it was not profitable. The first movie not, was okay, profitable. It wasn't as pro. Okay, fine. I'm gonna agree to disagree with you here. The most you important thing. It was not. It was not as profitable as the original Rocky. I can understand that. That, that, that is it, the most important thing. That studios growth. do not. Studios do not take into account. They think that that gross means that when it really doesn't. That's how they screw over people when it comes to Hollywood accounting. But it comes down to the net. It comes down to how much you put into it. Like the most profitable. The most profitable James Bond movie is not Skyfall. The most profitable movie is Doctor No. It had a budget of less than a million dollars, and it made um, a close eighty between eighty and ninety million dollars. That means it made back ninety times its initial investment. Skyfall. But was that on initial release, or was that over lifetime gross? No, initial release. The, the thing exploded, and then it made more in rentals and later on in revivals and stuff, and it made clear over a hundred million dollars by that point. Now, when you think of Skyfall, that's a two hundred fifty million dollar movie, something like that, right? Right. And it made a billion dollars. That's only. How many? That's only back four four times its budget back. So right, it didn't really. I, I, I get what you mean by. I, and I, you know, I you know the whole thing. What you is mean by you have to make two and a half times your budget to be profitable. Now, at least at least we can say about Oppenheimer here. This was the year Oppenheimer was a very profitable film because yeah, yes, so yes, it cost. We I get that it cost a hundred million to make, but at the same time, comparatively speaking, for the type made, of movie that it was, that's a that's a low budget in this day and age. Hundred million is a very it's interesting, low budget. Yeah, I mean, and, and on top of that, a hundred million dollar R rated fucking three hour drama. Yeah, it made a billion <laughs> and it made a billion dollars. And so, you know the thing, it made back nine times its budget. Now and Barbie, that's good. On the other that's hand, actually good. Everybody was happy at the end of the day. Everybody. Barbie also had a relatively. I mean, it wasn't. These aren't comic book movie budgets, so it's like 128 to 145 million at all. Plus, it made 1.446 billion, so it made back 10 times its budget. I would say so. It was profitable. That was kind of. I I, I don't know. People for some reason think that it was a foregone conclusion that Barbie was going to be a big hit. I didn't really think so. I thought it would probably. I didn't think it would make that much. I thought it would make about three hundred million, so I was a little surprised. But the thing is, they did cross promote it. Plus, you had the whole Barbenheimer thing. Have you heard about that? Yeah, the whole well, of where people do see I Barbie mean, and then Oppenheimer. I wish I would have seen Oppenheimer in the theater, but like I, I really wanted to see it in IMAX film, and unfortunately, I know we're gonna, nobody. Not going to have a difference of opinion on this, but I, I'm I so know. glad I did not see Oppenheimer in a movie theater. I'm so glad that I was sitting in my house with my family eating spaghetti and um, washing the dishes and cleaning the table. Actually, for Barbie, I had to leave um, after, I think, I forget when, somewhere halfway. And at the halfway point in Barbie, I just went into the kitchen and started doing dishes because nothing was happening. It was all just a bunch of, like, really terrible hammy performances and things that i really didn't like and um like i was mentioning before noah baumbach i i enjoyed his two he made two really good movies well he made some early movies with eric stoltz kicking and screaming and then another one i forgot and then he he sort of disappeared and then he came back writing with russ anderson then he made a movie called the squid and the whale with uh jeff daniel which and i've seen it and i thought it was okay it was and really jesse eisenberg cool. jesse eisenberg was in that that was the movie that launched Jesse Eisenberg and unleashed him upon the world. And that was a fine, ooh, fantastic film, loved it. And then he made Margot at the Wedding, which I also enjoyed. That was with Jack Black and his ex-wife, Jennifer Jason Lee. He starts hooking up with Greta Gerwig. And Greta Gerwig, I have some issues with. It's probably a, a, a controversial opinion, but I don't, frankly, I don't care. I'm 51. 
I know people who've worked with her because she started out in the Mumblecore movement. Uh, the Duplass brothers, who uh, had also had a deal with Film Threat around the time I had a deal with Film Threat. So stories circulated about Greta. Uh, she's kind of a star fucker, you know, and that's... Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. And now he's co-writing Barbie with her. So she also made a couple of other movies. We, we talked about... I, I still haven't seen Little Women, and that was nominated for an Oscar last uh, two years ago or something like that. Was it three years ago? I forget. Yeah, it was a couple of years back. She did make Lady Bird. Lady Bird was really nothing to to get get all crazy about either, because it just seemed like she took all her favorite John Hughes movies and made her own movie as a result of it. So it's not terribly original. She's not. She's really not remarkable, and she's not that great of an actress either, and she's not even that good looking. So you have to wonder what the fuck is going on here. Is this some kind of Me Too thing? You're, you're born... It's like when Pia Zadora won that Golden Globe back in 1981. And you're like, <laughs> what the fuck? Seriously? You yeah. Know, I mean, Nolan Nolan has talent, but for me, his best movie still remains Memento. And everything after that, he is just deliberately obtuse. And because he thinks obtuse is the way you tell a story. And Oppenheimer fails because of that. I just, I really, I dislike the movie. I think it had an incredible cast, but you don't get to appreciate anything about it. You don't get to appreciate the performances because he's drowning out everything with this incredible music. He just keeps playing over. And was, did Hans Zimmer do the music again for that one? No, Ludwig Göransson. So he said, he said, Ludwig, I want you to do what Hans does and just go for three hours and completely drown out any kind of performance or any kind of storytelling. And the whole thing is he shoots this thing in IMAX and it's all, most of the movie takes place in one rectangular shaped room with a long table and I just want to fucking kill him. I swear, I'm sorry that I feel that way. <laughs> but I'm, don't worry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. I, I'm <laughs> and also, sorry, I, I want to point out, I want to point I'm, this out too. You're talking about a period movie and these people, none of them look like period types. And the thing is, the zone of interest is a very interesting film in that way because the actors in it look like they are back in the in the late 30s, early 40s. They have the, the right body, the right color, the right sh pasty shade of skin, the right faces for that time. It, it almost, it's so accurate in that way. And that's what I was so surprised about. Maestro, no. Maestro, the same thing. All of these actors and their dialogue too. It all sounds like it was written in 2023. It all has this kind of wink and nod of 2023 flowing throughout it. It's like it could be written for Barbie or something. <laughs> so, so your your argument with Oppenheimer is that even though the movie takes place in the '40s, it's 2023 dialogue. It's like they're talking like they would today. Yeah, and you're looking at it through the eyes of 2023. It's like I'm in 2023. I'm sitting at my table and I'm going to write a story about people that existed 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. I have no idea. I would look at. I would. Look, I would try to look at old recordings. I, I would try to listen to old audio recordings if I could. I would try to look at old footage. I don't know what they were doing. I mean, like, Killian's a wonderful actor. I've always enjoyed him in everything, you know, but, yeah. you know, Red Eye is a great performance, but no one will ever take it seriously because it's a horror film. Something along those lines. It's Wes Craven. He was in a great movie that Danny Boyle made. Well, two great movies that Danny Boyle made. 28, 28, days, 28 later. days later and Sunshine. And Sunshine. Yes. Uh, he was in... He. He seems to be a favorite toy of Nolan now because he was in a Dark Knight movie, a couple of Dark Knight movies, right? He was Scarecrow. He yeah, was well, the he, was, he was, well, here's the thing. He, he was, was the only he legitimately was, terrifying bad guy for me. I'm sorry, Batman Begins is probably the bet my favorite of, of those movies. And the Scarecrow and what he does is absolutely horrifying. Yeah. He just popped in for a cameo in the other two. Like, he was in them, but they were cameos. You know, I mean, like, he's, he's a wonderful actor. I just think he's also too thin. I saw pictures of Oppenheimer. I was like, you could fit three Killian Murphys inside that thing. <laughs> Do a little tauntaun thing. I know it smells bad, kid, but it'll keep you warm until we get the shelter built. Um, but anyway, yeah, you could fit. like, and, and everybody in the movie looks like an actor from 2023. The most amazing, quote-unquote, transformation for me is Robert Downey. They make him look like an old man. He, he actually does look like the old man, but... yeah. You know, and he's got, but he's got his collapsed body that he still had from Avengers Endgame. <laughs> well, you know, he's okay. You know, I mean, like he's he's okay, 
but, but speaking really... of Oscars, you know he's going to win. He's it's it's well, that's lock. that's he's your gonna... theory. You think that this is a thank you for all those years of entertainment, which it's possible. Yes, definitely. It's just that I wish, with all the resources that Nolan had, that he was that he would have told told a story instead of this near endless montage that he has been doing ever since ever since The Dark Knight. I would say. I guess I will agree with you on that that whole mo- because the movie does feel like one big montage, but at for the same three time, hours, man. Yeah, but and it was, but you know what? It, it's better on. than that Killers of the Flower Moon. That's what kept me. That's what kept me with it because it felt like this giant montage. It kept me. It kept me with it. I think he um, wants you to just wet your pants and not go to the bathroom because he wants you to think that something important is going to happen in a second, you know? And I hate to say it, he succeeded because I, I, dude, I literally could have hit the pause button to go take a piss. I didn't do it. I'm like, I don't want to quit. This is too fucking good. <laughs> also, I want to say they overhyped <laughs> this nuclear bomb explosion because it just wasn't impressive. I mean, like, okay, if you've ever seen Twin Peaks, the revival, there's a the episode eight is the one that everybody talks about it and it's about the creation of the atom bomb and they show the atom bomb and they show these incredible visuals i don't know how lynch pulled it off but it is just absolutely fucking amazing and i think christopher nolan saw that episode and he said i want to make a movie about robert oppenheimer i think that's what inspired him because it was just absolutely out of this world that episode it was the most brilliant thing i had seen in so long and it was so hypnotic it even disturbed my daughter she's watching because there are these like really long takes of this atom bomb explosion happening. And as it's happening, other things are happening too. And my daughter was even getting disturbed and she loves David Lynch. And she's like, oh my God, what is going on here? So I think Nolan was inspired by that to make Oppenheimer. Before we, uh, since we've done that, I I really am curious as to why you didn't like Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh God, God. All right, well, you got three and a half hours. That's, That's the first thing you got against it. Number two, you have a story that that uh, is not worth the three and a half hours. The best part of Killers of the Flower Moon is the final scene of the radio show with Jack White in a weird cameo. It was so weird to see him. My wife is like, that's Jack White. And I was like, he's not an actor. What the fuck? And then we look at the credits and it's like Jack White. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. They tell the story on this little radio show thing that they do, this live radio show. That sort of pieces everything together. The final shot, though, I have to say the final shot, which is this aerial shot of all the crowd getting together. This, uh, I guess, I guess it was the descendants of these people. It's kind of like Schindler's List because you have the descendants of all these people. But basically, yeah. the story is is not interesting enough for a three and a, and a half hour movie. DiCaprio thinks that wearing dentures is going to make him look mildly retarded, and he's kind of right. I was re- I was reminded watching DiCaprio of Dax Shepard in Idiocracy. He's <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> go away, Baton. You know, I mean, he kind of reminded me of that. And then the whole story, I mean, basically. You have sweaty Indians that are dying of, of diabetes. And then you have, like, I guess Native white people. Native Americans. Think, sorry, sorry. American Indian, Native American, whatever. Lily Gladstone's Oscar nomination is the least deserving of any of these. And I haven't even seen Anatomy of a Fall or Poor Things. All she does is sweat, look pissed off, and die slowly from diabetes. That's all she does. And really, the sweat is doing most of the work for you. You don't even have to perform. She doesn't do anything. She's rock solid still, doesn't do anything. Leonardo DiCaprio sits down in chairs with Robert De Niro, who looks like he really doesn't want to be there. He looks completely bored out of his fucking skull. And he like comes into a room. It's like, okay, Marty, I can sit down for this scene, right? Thank you. And action. You know, and, and there's just no point to that. There's no passion in this. And also, uh, other than that last shot, the cinematography is not that great. It's just sort of your mustard vision thing again. You know, it's like this. And and I understand Amazon. Maybe this is the only way Scorsese can get these gigs now is by going to streaming services and offering his services because he did it with and the Irish. This is Apple, by the way, Apple, not Amazon. That was Apple. And the Irishman was Netflix. So I think he's going to wind up going to Hulu for his next. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, OK, listen, go listen, Amazon. go with me maybe on this. Go I'm going to make a. I'm going to make a four hour movie about um, um, what am I going to make a four hour movie about about my next door neighbor. OK, and, and you're going to roll the camera. It's going to be really great. That's my Scorsese impersonation, by the way. I just need the big eye. Well, you see, here's the it's thing. Just, OK, and it was. Well, let me finish one. Oh, one more God. thought. This is all just it's all politically correct. Horrible. Oh, white people are hor- white people. So horrible, basically, for three and a half hours. And it doesn't go anywhere. And I want. Oh, my God. The, the last Scorsese movie that I think raised questions 
and I kind of didn't want to end was Shutter uh, Shutter Island. Yeah, that mm -hmm. movie. I, I there were a lot of flaws with it, but. It was a movie that made me question things. And I was like, what is going on here? We are playing around with reality. We are playing around with, with uh, you know, it, 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 it's almost like Martin Scorsese's version of The Matrix or something like that. It's like, this is, it's, it, there's, it just raises more questions than it answers. This, no, no. Try again, Martin. Or don't, retire. You have a great career. You have such an incredible legacy. Don't do this again. Okay, what are your so thoughts? I guess what you're trying to say is Martin Scorsese's last good movie was The Departed. Okay. Well, that, I don't know. Um, let's take a look. I want to take a look. Well, okay, Shutter Island you really liked, but then again you've I, well, Hugo, I mean, you Sh Shutter okay. Island was no, no. Okay, um, I really enjoyed The Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, like, I forgot about but, Wolf of Wall Street. Fuck but the movie. Quaalude scene is probably the real standout of that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fucking good, right? <laughs> you have to phone the FBI! <laughs> See, okay, now that... I was laughing my ass off. I had to go back and rewind it a hundred times just to watch it again and again and again. Him trying to climb the stairs and everything. Now, um, <clears throat> the last, I would say the last truly, the last truly of the old era of Martin Scorsese was probably Bringing Out the Dead. I did, mm -hmm. I, I do enjoy Gangs of New York quite a bit. I like The Aviator. I like The Departed. I like Shutter Island. Not a fan of Hugo, though, unfortunately. I mean, I've seen better movies than Hugo that were talking about the magic of cinema and all that stuff, movie magic. But I did like Wolf of Wall, Wolf of Wall Street had a little bit of that young man again, that young coke sniffing yeah. man. And there was he I feel like he did go back in his head to what were, what were my coke days like? OK, they were like that. Let's do it this way. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I am. So go ahead. You well, can, tell so me how wrong I am about this movie. Uh, I'm not. You know what? I, 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 I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong, because, again, this is a you know, this is a democratic society here. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. It's a constitutional um, republic. I enjoyed Killers of the Flower Moon. I am not going to say Seriously? It's up for there. three and a half hours? Well, exactly. again, I made the comparisons to Heaven's Gate. Okay. I You're did too. I was thinking about you, that. Literally just, you literally just did the, the Heaven's Gate thing where saying nobody wants to sit around and watch a three and a half hour movie or a four hour movie about a dark underbelly part of American history. That's exactly what Heaven's Gate was about. And yeah. I, you know, but I under, but here's but you like Heaven's Gate. I, I, I know we talked about Heaven's Gate. I bought, I bought the Gate. Criterion Blu-ray and I was like, okay, at some point I'm gonna show you. I've been showing my wife because she'd never seen it. I said, We're gonna we're gonna pop in the Heaven's Gate Blu-ray. The thing about Heaven's Gate though is different is that things are actually happening in it. <laughs> no, it's not just people sitting around being depressed and dying all the time. But That's okay, I, I okay. I have made comparisons to Heaven's Gate while watching Killers of the Flower Moon. All, all it Jace basically shows is Scorsese can make a movie like Michael Cimino could make, but yet he gets more praise than Michael Cimino gets. I did enjoy Killers of the Flower Moon. However, it is not one of Scorsese's best movies. Like, for a movie that came out in the year that it did, it was one of the better films of, the, of this year to me, but in general, like... I'm not going to rank it as top 10 Scorsese. It never will be. Mm. I can think of 10 other Scorsese movies I'd rather watch. I can tell you know? 10 lesser Scorsese movies that are about yeah. it. I mean, the it's passion like, is I, just I, not I, there. And you know, I, can like, also, I can also backtrack a little bit and say the same thing about Oppenheimer. While I think for the year that it came out, it's one of the best movies of the year, is it one of Christopher Nolan's best films? Even and now, he, now, granted... Nolan's only been around for 20 plus years and Scorsese's been around for 60. Okay, so Scorsese's got a bigger filmography. And a much more I impressive could maybe, one. I could think of maybe five or six other Christopher Nolan movies I'd rather watch than not. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, can think, I can think of every, any, pretty much anything. There's only, you know, you, this may shock you, still, but there's still one big Scorsese movie I haven't seen. And that is the color of money. I need to see that. Oh my god! Well, yeah. oh my god! Yes, yes, yes. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll tell you right now. Have you seen the Hustler? Yeah, I've seen the Hustler. The Hustler, believe it or not, is the better movie. 
The problem is that the, I think the well, of course it is. It's a classic. It's you know and all that stuff. The old black and whiteies, as they used to call them. Um, but the Color of Money is a hard movie to find. You can't really find it on streaming. You can't find it. I don't even know if it has a Blu-ray release at this yes, point. Yes, it I'm, I'm. You know what the funny thing is? I'm staring at my Blu-ray copy right now. Is it available? I, find I believe it. it is still available for purchase. I believe it is. But let me check. You can still get it. So but it just never know, comes up in conversation. But, pro- but here's the problem: the Blu-ray sucks ass. Really? It's a terrible. Uh... Oh, that they used a. Uh, D- Disney went on the cheap, and they used the DVD era master, as in a whole bunch of edge enhancement and noise reduction. Ah, they yeah. didn't like. They didn't like scan a film print. They just went back to the old master that was created for DVD. And but just, they never. Like, they never seem to show they, it on cable. They never seem to show it on any channels. I can never find it. So you know. I'm surprised it's not on Hulu. I'm really surprised it's not on Hulu. Uh, maybe it's two different companies. You've got well, it is Touchstone, uh, which yeah. was Disney. But there are there are a couple of of these movies back from the '80s that were made by Touchstone, in conjunction with Silver Screen Partners, that you can't find. Maybe because they're zombie titles that are produced by different production companies. In addition, uh, to I'm that. still I'm I'm waiting for Kino to freaking do something with that because i know kino they'll they'll get out there they'll do a 4k one of these days like color of money is due it's due for a new blu-ray like dude fucking footloose finally got a new blu-ray okay or and Mm -hmm. i bought that for the wife for thanksgiving but the old footloose blu-ray was fucking garbage it was Mm. trash it was literally an old the old dvd master just Slapped on some edge enhancement. In the <coughs> this one, they at least went back to the negative. They rescanned it, and the 4K looks amazing. So, right. I mean, not not like stupid, stupid amazing, but you know, for a for a 40 year old movie, hey, it looks way better than, well, the, than the yeah. Movie. And to be fair, you know, the color the color money revived Scorsese's career at that point. Remember, he was trying to make Last Temptation um, after he had finished King of Comedy. He couldn't get it made, so he went and made After Hours because someone gave him the script. That got a lot of uh, notoriety, especially at Con at the Con Film Festival. And then he got Color of Money because Paul Newman was a big fan. So Paul Newman picked him, basically, hand picked him to direct the movie because of Color of Money's success. He was able to get he was able to get Last Temptation of Christ made, and then he got Goodfellas running, and that that was the later part of that part of his career. That got him really going. I enjoy the hell out of Color of Money. I used to play in a pool league years and years ago. I have fallen off my game since I. You know, my dad always said it was a 3P man, pool, poker, and pussy. Well, you know what? I got rid of pool, <laughs> <laughs> and I started playing poker. So. Your old man had a mouth on him, didn't he? <laughs> oh, he was my old man. It was the best, dude. I love my old man. He was the greatest guy ever, man. Like a sailor. Like I said, you gotta got to be a 3P man, you know? And I'm like, well, you know what? I, I, got rid of, I got rid of pool because I found out I was a better – I found out I was a way better poker player than I was a pool player. You know that's the opposite. So, of me. I'm, a, I'm a better, much better pool player than I ever was at poker. But uh, okay, Killers of the Flower Moon. My main problem is that they think they're engendering controversy, but we're in now this age of uh, hating white people no matter what. So there's really nothing controversial about this film. Uh, I want to move on to the movies. Okay, Maestro. Maestro is a um, is is was went from boring to depressing, is what I wrote in my notes. There's really <laughs> nothing in there. It's like. Every one of these biopics now is basically following the formula of a of a VH1 behind the music, which is. Can I can I just say can I just say one thing real quick? Mm. I've I've heard that Maestro is basically Bradley Cooper stuck in his own dick. <laughs> Actually, I, I'll give it this: it's under. It's like one of the few movies that's under two hours. <laughs> this movie, well, it, and if it was if it was an hour and fifty minutes of him blowing himself. <laughs> That would have been far more entertaining. It would have been. It's just about a guy who gets his cake and eats it, too. He gets to be married and have children, but also be wildly gay and running around and dancing in gay bars and stuff like that. Uh, the makeup, the old age makeup is very good. And the cancer makeup for Carrie Mulligan. Carrie Mulligan's an okay actress. She's not that great. I remember her back from a Doctor Who episode a long time ago. And then she became this... A successful actress later on. She was in that movie She Said, which was about the whole Harvey Weinstein thing. But in this, she plays his wife, and it's basically the same story. People that he he got to live a long life though for a guy who who pitched for both teams, so to speak. Uh, he's okay. Bradley Cooper's okay. 
He's a very musical kind of guy, like, you know, A Star is Born like he did in that movie and everything. The only reason this movie got nominations is because Spielberg and Scorsese produced it. That's what I think uh, it was about. Visually, it's not that great. He's trying to do what, what Scorsese did with, um, with The Aviator. You know how Scorsese tried to make it look like a classic movie? Right. That kind of thing. I think maybe that... But Scorsese succeeded, whereas yeah. Bradley Cooper probably didn't. Aviator, I really, yeah, I really like the Aviator. Uh, Bradley Cooper, he's a talented guy, but this movie doesn't really belong there. It doesn't belong on the list. Maybe for makeup. I would give it makeup. It does a fine job with the makeup. Um, now, American Fiction is a, a, my second favorite of the nominees. It's a, it's, it's a great movie. Unfortunately, because it's about a black writer, Jeffrey Wright is really good in it. Um, I asked the question, why is this movie being ignored? And it's like, well, we all hate Jeffrey Wright. And I'm like, why do you hate Jeffrey Wright? It's just because he's woke. He's a woke actor and he's always bitching and moaning. He's like Mark Ruffalo and just shut the fuck up and all that stuff. And also we, we heard that the movie uh, makes fun of white liberals. And the thing is, that is what the movie does. That's why the movie is brilliant, because it makes fun of white liberals and their idea of black people. Uh, Jeffrey Wright plays a writer, but he's not very successful. And it seems like his agent wants him to write something that's all about gang and thug, thug life and all that stuff. And he's like, I'm a writer. I don't do that. So he invents a persona. It's a nom de plume. And he, he changes his name to um, uh, Stag, Stagger Lee. <laughs> and <laughs> Stagger Lee writes this book that he calls Fuck. <laughs> and it winds up becoming this huge hit. And it's all about, it's bullshit. It's just he's making up stories and... Because he notices that all these like other black writers, these all these prominent black writers are just writing about crime and and being the thug and the, the hood and all that stuff, and he's not really like that. He's just sort of like a, any normal guy or anything. He's not some horrible vicious stereotype. So the movie makes fun of white liberals in that way, and it does it the same way that Jordan Peele did it with Get Out a few years late, uh, earlier, and everybody loved him for that, you know. But now apparently we can't do that. So it's 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 a really it's it, there were moments in the movie that had me laughing my ass off. It was a really funny movie, and it was also very poignant too. It had a really good cast, good performances, you know. Um, All right, I'll check it out. You should, you should absolutely. It's like I said, the second best. Now the first best and first best is such a stupid thing to say. Uh, like I said, out of the ten movies, I've only seen seven. I haven't seen Past Lives, Poor Things, or uh, is that it? Wait a minute. Okay, saw that, saw that, saw that, saw that, saw that. Oh, Anatomy of Fall. Sorry. So that's three. The three movies I haven't seen. The best movie in on this list is The Zone of Interest. Uh, I didn't know I was going to like it as much as I did because it 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 wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. But Jonathan Glazer directed it. He's a filmmaker I've always enjoyed. He made a movie called Sexy Beast with Ben Kingsley. It was his first one. Yep. And then he made a movie called Birth with Nicole Kidman about a, a woman whose husband dies and is somehow reincarnated into the form of this child. Great movie. Wonderful. I saw it in the movie theater, actually. And then he made a movie called Under the Skin with Scarlett Johansson, a fantastic science fiction movie about this alien from another planet that comes down and kills a bunch of people in Scotland. Scarlett Johansson plays that person. It was really, really good. He is, he is a, he ha, he's, I guess he's an old man. So he hasn't made that many films, but the thing is, he has such wisdom for a filmmaker. And he tells the most interesting story available. The Zone of Interest is his next movie after that. It was written, it was based on a book by Martin Amos. Martin Amos died last year, so uh, the movie is dedicated to him, as well as a bunch of other people that were involved in the storytelling of it. It's about a, um, a Nazi, uh, a German commandant who runs a concentration camp. And his family and him live in this luxurious mansion right outside the gates of the concentration camp. You never see what's going on inside the concentration camp, but what you do here is is incredible because these people are just like living their lives, like nothing is going on, nothing is, um, nothing is unusual, and yet we hear screams and we hear machine guns and we hear torture, sounds of torture. Uh, the Zone of Interest does get, also gets a nomination for Best Sound, and I think it should win, because that is what the movie's about. It's about the sounds we hear. I, I, I mean, I can't recommend it. It is really, just, it's a great film. It's a, it's such a good film. Feel like you have to see it. Now, you know what? I got some time tonight. You know, I really, really, really want to see Poor Thing. I really want to see that movie. 
I'm getting, you know, I'm getting around the four things, I suppose. I'd be, we'll probably, um... I mean, until then, I can watch Frankenhooker, but... <laughs> <laughs> Frankenhooker is, was one of the greatest movies of 1986, and it should have gotten sound nominations, at least. It didn't. Uh, we should have, like, God, we should, you know what we should do, Frillick? We should do, mm. we should do a thing where we talk about... <laughs> Our favorite stupid, really horror movies and gore movies and, and sex or whatever movies, and make them the best picture nominees instead. Well, he, well, then Frank Henenlotter would fucking get all the categories because uh, the the Gene Herschel Award should go to Frank <laughs> Henenlotter, <laughs> and then after that, um, um, who else? David DeCocteau for <laughs> yeah, David DeCocteau. or or Stuart Gordon or or somebody like yeah, that Stuart or Charles Gordon. Band. Bri fuck, Bri fuck Charles Bri Band. Brian Brian Usna. We should we should dedicate the Charles Band Award to Brian Yuzna. Um but uh, yeah, that yeah, Zone of Interest takes what would have been like a routine. So even Spielberg commented on it. He said it was like I'd never seen a Holocaust movie done in quite this way. I want to say it kind of humanizes the Germans because when you humanize them, you can understand them more, and it makes it more disturbing to know that these are people who love each other and who have families and are able to express affection yet go across the wall to commit unspeakable atrocities on another group of people. It I'll, really makes you think about that. I'll check it out. You know what? I'll, I said, I got some time tonight and yeah, I'll, I'll check it out tonight. I know it's probably, I can find <laughs> it. Like I said, I can't, I can't watch poor things yet because it's not on streaming yet. You can't rent it. You can't do anything. I guess we'll wrap it up real quick. Well, we pretty much know that, you know, in spite of everything that we've talked about here and what we think are deserving of the nominations that they got. You think it's going to be up? Know, well, we already know the, the cards are stacked. The deck is stacked. You know, Oppenheimer's going to take it all, you know, but I would hope to see a couple of surprises, you know, if like, you know, if if some of these other movies like American Fiction or, you know, Poor Things, Anatomy of the Falls, if they win in some technical categories, that would be nice. That would be very nice to at least get some recognition. But well, we I all think, know this, you know, this is the year of Oppenheimer, man. It's the year of I think it's a, I don't know about that either because of the Jewish quotient. And this is a problem here. Uh, it's a very political year for movies, for Oscars, for entertainers. Zone of interest in American fiction will most likely be ignored because zone of interest is about mistreatment of Jews. American fiction is about mistreatment of black people by white liberals, and white liberals are pretty much make up the academy. I was really shocked that it got as many nominations as it did. Oppenheimer is about a Jew who builds a bomb that blows up the world. I don't know how that's going to pull fly over. There may be an upset, you know, like a La La Land. No, because... <laughs> um... Yeah, DGA has already happened, man. Nolan got it, and mm. uh, SAG, SAG's happened. But again, La La Land. I must point out La La Land. Yeah, but <laughs> then, but then that movie Moonlight, it had it had a lot of fucking steam behind it, you know. Yeah. And even da even Damien Chazelle, even he got the DGA, and he still got Best Director for La La Land. It was just Moonlight fucking pulled the upset. Moonlight, I don't get. It must have been that thing about gay. Uh, I had gay sex with my friend a long time ago, and then I meet him again. <laughs> that was the movie for me. <laughs> um, I will say, okay, at the very bottom of the list, Barbie should not be there. Barbie should not be there. Uh, production design and cinematography, yes. The production design and cinematography of Barbie was staggering. It looked like a toy. The movie looked like a fucking toy. It looked like a playset. Other than that, no. Performances, no. Direction, no. Well, actually, Greta didn't even get nominated for director. Did yeah, she? she didn't even get nominated. <laughs> she got dissed. She got the Spielberg diss, <laughs> which is basically, well, nominate for Best Picture, but fuck you, Spielberg. Yep. <laughs> well, um, like okay. I said, we'll see. We'll see what ha hey, we'll see what happens come Oscar night, and of course, you know, we have another. We'll do the show that'll discuss the winners and everything like that. We'll talk about the yeah, winners. We can, we can do that. Yeah, we always. Hopefully, do that. we won't wait as, waste as much time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should. We'll figure it. Well. We'll get all the bugs worked out by then. But unfortunately, it is time to wrap up because I have a child from college I have to go pick up right now. All right. All so, right. but uh, all right. as, so, always, uh, as we always say, like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you at the movies. But um, yes. Bum, 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 but no, but bum, unlike bum, Cisco bum. Lieber, no two thumbs up in this episode, man. It was two, no, it was two always middle fingers up. Here. <laughs> yeah, it was two middle fingers up for a lot of shit. So, good night, everybody. Good night.